Hello and welcome back to Human Evolution. Today I want to talk about some exceptions um, and some special cases when we're talking about selection and things like that. And I've actually entitled this The Magic of Islands because islands do some pretty amazing things in terms of pressures and opportunities. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But first, um, I want to talk a little bit about dispersal. How do species get everywhere? Um, and there are a number of ways that they can do that. So here's your first question. All of today's continents were part of one large landmass about 225 million years ago. That's true, and it was called Pangaea, and we probably know that. So one of the ways that you can actually get dispersion um, or species distribution is dispersal through continuous habitat. And so we found that some um, organisms that were alive 225 million years ago have actually spread simply by walking, right? Um, now, as continents drift and things like that, that leads to new conditions and um, adaptation to new conditions or not will affect species distribution. And then the other thing we talk about is something called jump dispersal, which is across a major barrier. And that could be a sea, um, if you're really small, it could be a river, mountain ranges, um, whatever, you know. But this is going to be particularly important when we start talking about islands, because obviously there's a major barrier to get there. And then abiotic factors would include things like climate change, right? Um, and then you have your eustatic events, which are changes in things like sea levels or um, glaciation or the retreat of glaciers, these big events. And then tectonic events are like what I was talking about with continental drift and mountains and stuff like that, okay? And now here's your second question. Just as an aside, humans are not important to the dispersal of other species, true or false? That is false, right? We actually carry um, species all over the place, both unintentionally and intentionally, many of whom become invasive later on. Okay, now back to our um, dispersal. We have talked a little bit about adaptive radiation. Um, and we've talked mostly about adaptive radiation, which is the development of many species that are derived from a single ancestral population. And Darwin's finches are always the one that come up um, in terms of, or the example that comes up, um, because you have all of these different kinds of birds that are descended from a single mainland population of finches that, you know, flew over. And then you had island hopping from there of the species and many niches to fill. And we've talked about that. Um, but one of the things, and we've talked about adaptive radiation specifically after um, an extinction event, a mass extinction event, and how important that actually is to biodiversity. Now, having said that, though, remember that the Galapagos are islands, right? And here's another example. Um, there are some plants called silver swords, and they are in Hawaii, and you can find them on all different islands, and they take lots of different appearances, very much like... Um, the finches, Darwin's finches, and it, they seem to be all descended from a single member of the sunflower family that came out of California. And you can see that they have a huge variety and that goes to that adaptation to different niches, right? But one of the things that you find is that no matter how much adaptive radiation you have, you typically have fewer species on islands than on mainlands, right? And so the big question becomes, in terms of island biogeography, why? Why is that true? Okay. Well, it's a function of two things, the size of the island and the distance from the mainland. Okay. Small islands tend to have higher extinction rates. Why would that be true? Well, let's think about it. Small islands have physically less space, and so there are, there's fewer, um, there are fewer territories that would be available. There's fewer resources that would be available. And so it's very difficult to get a foothold, um, especially if you're a later incoming species. And then the other thing is that makes perfect sense is that the farther away an island is, it doesn't matter how big it is, it's going to have a lower probability of, of species actually getting there of what we call immigration. So think about if you are a small um, far away island, you're going to have very few species. If you're a large close island, right, then you're probably going to have a lot more. And when you graph that, it looks something like this, right? So colonization rate, far islands much lower than near islands, um, and then large islands have a lower extinction rate than small islands, and you can see how these 
correspond to each other. Um, and this makes predictions about what you're going to find on any given island. And um, this was a hypothesis, the, the, the well, it's a theory, the theory of island biogeography that was propo proposed um, by two gentlemen, and then who are E.O. Wilson um, and Robert MacArthur. So, right, they said that you would be able to predict the number of species, which is what I just said. So, how do we verify that? Well, it's hard to get new islands, although in 1883 there was a volcanic eruption on the island of Krakatoa, which you're probably familiar with, that actually destroyed the island. Uh, it was a very big deal, huge, huge explosion. Now, since then, a new island called Anak Krakatau, which means son of Krakatoa or child of Krakatoa, um, appeared following the eruption and it has grown consistently uh, over time, which is a brand new island. And scientists have actually been able to collect data on the colonization and the species richness of this new island. And you can see here, um, trees are already there, but it's still an active volcano. It was super active between 1992 and 1997, um, but it's, it's definitely a growing um, island there, right, or volcano rather. So back to Robert MacArthur and E.O. Wilson, um, they predicted that for this island, um, the equilibrium value, and that's where those lines cross on the graph, those are the equilibrium values, that would be about 30 bird species um, over about 40 years with a turnover rate of about one species per year. And when people started looking at that, in 1908 there were 13 species. Species In 1921 there were 27 species. In 1934 there were 27 species, but there had been a turnover of five, which, and if you look at that, that's five years, and so that's about one per year. Um, and then if you come up here and you look at the the graph by 1950 right um, you have between 30 and 40 species right and so that is a really good confirmation verification of of that prediction okay and it hasn't really gotten a whole lot um, larger in terms of the number of species it's leveled off because you're reaching that carrying capacity of the island now the island of Flores is the island that we want to look at in terms of these interesting things that happen on islands, right? In the island of Flores, which is in Indonesia, um, we find Homo floresiensis, better known as the Hobbit. And this discovery was made in a cave in the highlands um, called Liang Bua. And this is the cave. It's a huge limestone cave. And one of the first individuals that was found is LB1, um, and this is the skeleton here. And you can't tell a whole lot, but when you start really looking at these individuals, and, and I think there are about 13 individuals now, it's 9 or 13, somewhere around there, um, they all have some very specific and unusual things in common. And the first one is they're very tiny. The adults are about 3 feet tall. Okay, and so when you look at Homo sapiens, for instance, um, you start seeing this distribution of height and the pygmies that are actually found on that island, right, um, they all range around 57 inches, which is pretty short, this is around 4 feet, um, well, a little bit taller than 4 feet, because 48 inches would be 4 feet, so there you go. Um, so it's between four and five feet. Um, then you start moving into other populations. Your European populations are um, around 72, 73 inches. Um, and then some of your African populations are going to be um, closer to 65, 66, 67 uh, centimeters there. Okay. So we have a wide variety in heights, but on Flores, for Homo floresiensis, they don't. They're, they're all um, within a certain range, and you can see that these are within certain ranges too, right? And you've got high ends and means and medians and all that good stuff. But none of the Homo sapiens really consistently end up about three feet tall, right? And so this is the first real major difference that we find between Homo floresiensis and us. Because originally, when Homo floresiensis was found, the hypothesis was that they were a group of pygmy Homo sapiens right? And so that was the first hypothesis about who they are. But when we started really looking at height distribution, which is why I've been talking about it, we find that that's unlikely based on that, 
Okay. The second big thing that we notice about Homo floresiensis, the hobbits, is that they have tiny heads with tiny brains. Their brains are about chimpanzee sized, right? Um, and so that means that they should be much more like chimpanzees. And when you start looking at the increase in body size, um, and an increase in brain size, you can actually see a trend that moves like this, right? But Homo floresiensis is outside of that trend. And so one of the hypotheses was that Homo sapiens um, arrived in Indonesia and Homo floresiensis was derived from Homo sapiens, but the brain situation was really not in line with that. And so another hypothesis came up, right? So first of all, let's look at the brain because we know we've got the small brain. Here is um, a microcephalic human, right? Here's Homo erectus, here's Neanderthalensis, and here is normal Homo sapiens, okay? This, this next hypothesis was that they were all in fact Homo sapiens, um, but they were microcephalic homo sapiens, and those are people who have small brains. Now, typically, they don't have um, as short a stature, um, and some of them don't have a short stature at all, but they do have tiny little brains, okay? So when we start looking at Homo floresiensis, who is here on the right, and a microcephalic, you can see that these brains are very much not the same, okay? You have these clearly defined lobes right here in the prefrontal cortex. Um, you have a narrower, it's not as, as vertical, right? So it's more squished, um, more like Neanderthal and, and things like that. Um, and then you have these really well-formed lobes here in the back of the brain. Um, and you can see that there's distinction here, right, um, around the organization, and it's organized differently than a microcephalic. So that really um, ruled out that Homo um, floresiensis was microcephalic humans, right, that they were microcephalic humans, Homo sapiens. The other thing that was important to that is that they all had tools, right? Lots of tools were found in Liang Bua, and they look a lot like this, and here's another set of tools that were found there. Um, and interestingly enough, they match the same tools that were found in the Olduvai Gorge. These are Oldowan tools, right? And we know the Oldowan tools were used by earlier Homo erectus, right? Um, and so you can see this whole range. These are all the Olduvai Gorge tools, all Oldowan right? Um, big similarities. And so that also indicated that they were not microcephalic humans because micro or homo sapiens, because microcephalic homo sapiens would not have um, probably the capability to do that necessarily. Okay. Now here's the other interesting thing about them. Their little chimpanzee brain size is very, very tiny, right? And we know that chimpanzees don't craft stone tools. So what about their brains would allow them to do that? And a very interesting thing happens. In the prefrontal cortex, you have these folds, and they turn out to be very important to problem solving and complex thought. But when you look at um, some of the other endocasts of other species, you don't see them as clearly defined as you do here. Having said that though, look at the brain of Homo floresiensis. You have these very distinct grooves here on the front of the brain, and that may in fact account for why they could have tiny brains and still be able to make tools. So given all of these things, um, and we have decided that Homo floresiensis is in fact its own species. Right? So, as we start looking at life for Homo floresiensis, what would it have been like? Okay, first of all, they were really tiny. Um, and islands have a way of shrinking things, especially endotherms, right? And larger endotherms, right? Warm blooded uh, animals. And so, if you look at this little guy right here, the hobbits would have found meat. Um, in hunting pygmy elephants. And the pygmy elephants were around four feet tall. And so they were something else that were affected uh, by this island kind of biogeography situation. Islands don't provide a whole lot of resources, okay? Um, especially if you are a large herbivore. And so a large herbivores get scaled down, right? Um, and so this is an Asian elephant, right? That has been scaled down essentially. Now, not all endotherms are affected this way, right? R small rodent type things um, 
generalists especially will sometimes get large and so the hobbit shared the island with huge rats giant rats um, and because they can exploit lots of different resources they have the ability to scale up right um, there are lots of owls which would have gone with the smaller mammals right um, and then the other thing that happens is you can get ectotherms cold-blooded animals that can scale up because remember ectotherms don't need a lot of food right and so the limited resources um, really don't affect them that much and so the hobbit would have had a predator in these very large uh, Komodo dragon lizards right monitor lizards that were also on the island so life for the hobbit oh and there were also these huge like carnivorous birds um, that are storks and they were really tall I mean like six feet tall right somewhere around there so life was very dangerous for the hobbits okay so where do the hobbits come from right we know that the hobbits existed uh, from about hundred thousand years ago to about 40,000 years ago and that 40,000 year date is is very new um, you might hear around 18 to 12,000 years ago but we now know that that's actually um, way too late that they probably went extinct around 40,000 years ago okay but homo sapiens arrive on Flores about 55,000 years ago okay um, so if they were there 100,000 years ago it means that homo sapiens cannot be the ancestor of hobbits so who was right so the question we need to ask is who else would have gotten to indonesia homo heidelbergensis no but homo erectus did homo erectus arrived in indonesia between 1 million years ago and 700,000 years ago okay um and so homo erectus is the candidate um for the um, ancestor of the hobbits and if you look at Homo erectus and Homo floresiensis obviously these are not to scale but if you look at these two you can really see that Homo floresiensis um, is is very much a scaled down um, more compact version of Homo erectus and that's a very interesting thing and by the way this is the Homo naledi scale that came um, out of South Africa I put this in here because we haven't talked about Homo naledi um, because there's not really a lot to talk about just right now but there will be soon um, but I didn't want you to forget about them so anyway so that's a little um, side note in there so we've got this skull this this very Homo erectus style skull and another interesting thing these were the tools at Liang Bua these are the tools at Madame Menge um, these are Homo erectus tools these are Homo floresiensis tools they are very similar right and so you've got this maintenance of this um, tool industry okay now there is this potential for having a, a 15,000 year overlap um, between humans and hobbits and interestingly enough um, in the tribes on um, Flores right in the area of Liang Bua there's an oral history about these creatures called the um, Ibu Gogo that were small they couldn't pronounce words and they walked oddly and this description really does resemble the hobbits so is it possible that we did have this little overlap um, and we interacted with them right um, so we're pretty sure that they came that they evolved from Homo erectus um, but what we are not sure about is if we had any contact with them because the problem is is that not only does this description resemble the hobbits it also describes orangutans so um, an orangutan actually in the local language means old man of the forest so we don't really have a lot of information about that but now you know a little bit more about hobbits and humans and what I like to call the magic of islands all right if you have any questions please let me know at the beginning of class or you may put them on the Google Doc uh, question board and uh, thanks for listening I'll see you next time